Let's close eyes for prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the series we've been going through. Thank you because of your vision and because of your decision that you want to raise up leaders in these last days in your church. And we know that the people you have your hands on are listening to you. And as we listen and come before you, we know you are going to do what needs to be done within us so we can be the leaders that will be able to face the challenges of this day and do the work you have given us to do, like you want it done. We know, Lord, that these last days demand leaders who are touched by you, trained by you, transformed by you. And those who are not touched and trained and transformed by you, we know they are going to get out of the way for them to leave the space and the place for those who are really called of you and qualified by you. We are praying, O oh Lord, at this time, that as many of us as you have really called will give in to your word and your hand of grace and love and mercy and power will touch and transform every one of us in Jesus' name. That the work you want to do, you begin that work within us. And then through us, you'll do your perfect will in your kingdom. We thank you because we know you will do what you have decided to do. And we yield ourselves to you. So it can be done without any hindrance or limitation. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come in our series to another subject. And this is very, very important indeed. We've been talking on leadership. And we've been going through the leadership series using the letters of the word leadership. L for love. Love in Christ-like leadership. If there's anything that is going to do the work today, it is the leadership kind, the, the kind of leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. There had been 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Idolatry had set in. And the religion of the Jews had actually become a religion of tradition, superstition, idolatry. And they worship religion rather than worshiping God. And at such a time, Christ came. And when Christ came, then he manifested his leadership. There was no convert, there was nobody to follow after him. He began to call them one by one. And he said, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He spent three and a half years all together, training them, touching their lives, turning them around, transforming them teaching them the words and the truth of the kingdom and then he left and he told them you wait in jerusalem you have a work to do and the traditionalists have not all died and they're still practicing their idolatry they worship tradition more than worshiping god and you are the one to confront them and the church is to be built and the kingdom is to be established and if that is to be done, you need something within you so you can do it the way I've done it. And God raised up those few people and those were the people that are taking the gospel all through Jerusalem and Judah, Samaria. Now it's come to the uttermost part of the earth. God needs leaders like that today. And that's why we have looked into all this. And except there is a touch, there's a change, there's a transformation. We're not going to be able to do the work. Having Congress, as usual, retreat, as usual, conference, as usual, it's not going to raise up the kind of leaders that the Lord is looking for. And if God is raising you up in these days of tradition and superstition and idolatry and religion, if the Lord is raising you up, you need to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I know I ought to be a kind of leader that is consecrated, commissioned, and qualified by you. Here I am. Do the work in me, and then will he make you a kind of Christ-like leader. Then we dealt with effectiveness of competent leadership. Competence is a word that is thrown out in the world today. 
and you look at even the educational system in our country or any country and you look at all the other areas of profession in the country any country in africa they're doing something that they're throwing away the people that are not competent and if that is so in these last days god himself and the creator of the whole universe as well as our savior lord and redeemer the head of the church he cannot keep the people who are not competent in the work of the lord if there is anything the lord is looking for he's looking for the people that are qualified and competent the people that the Lord himself he has grabbed you, he has held you, he's holding you down and he's drilling you and he's putting the word in your life and in your spirit and he says I'm looking for one thing competence and then you go out there and what the Lord appoints for you to do there is competence it is only that competence in leadership and the confidence in the Lord all combined together that will bring the effectiveness that the Lord is looking for today there are many preachers are they competent and effective there are many evangelists they may even gather large crowds together are they competent and effective when the evangelist uh, Philip when he got to Samaria things changed the churches were populated we find evangelists that are ministering today and during those five days or six days or seven days or two weeks of the crusade maybe there'll be a lot of people there you see a sea of heads the question is competence effectiveness is the competence there is the effectiveness there do we see those converts in church is the community becoming converted and cleansed is there a change in the religion of the land are the hearts of the people like the thessalonians are they being turned away from the dead gods and the idolatry that they are in are they turning to the living and the true god effectiveness competence teachers of the word of god that will be effective that will be competent that's why the lord is leading us through all this series and is telling us forget the past forget what you have done forget where you have been effectiveness of competent leaders and then we add the aid that's the anointing how many people that carry oil about the bottle of oil and they think that if they put a bottle of oil on you they think that that is the anointing they think that is the anointing that breaks the yoke in acts of the apostles chapter 3 i didn't see any bottle of oil in the hand of peter all i hear is silver and gold have i none but such as i have i give unto you in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk and the miracle happened in acts of the apostles chapter 5 i didn't see any bottle of oil in the hand of peter all he did is he walked through the street and the anointing was not only in his body the anointing was shadow and as a shadow came upon all those people not the bottle of oil not smearing them rubbing them with oil as a shadow fell on them i saw that they got up and they were delivered they were healed in acts of the apostles chapter 8 i don't see any bottle in the hand of philip all we hear is he went over to samaria and he preached jesus unto them and the name of jesus the power in that name made all those people all the people that had been captivated in captivity to simon the sorcerer all of them they saw the naked demonstration of the mighty power of the almighty god and all of them were healed and evil spirits crying out they were delivered and those uh, people they came to the lord they were baptized they remained in the church in acts of the apostles chapter 9 there's no anointing oil in the hands of peter because they told him that Dorcas had died and because he was nearby in Joppa, then they called him and when he got there tabito arise and then the dead arose 
And in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, did I see any oil in the hand of Peter when he began to speak the word and the Holy Ghost came upon them as the Holy Ghost came upon us at the beginning and we had them they began to speak in tongues and then we said can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized because the gift of the Holy Ghost had been given to them like it was given to us and then were they baptized in water because they had been baptized the Holy Ghost saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost what we're saying is we need the genuine anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon leaders today so that we'll go out of this place, we'll not be doing child's play anymore. They'll not be, you know, just come to Congress and play games and come to retreat and play games and come to Congress and, and conference and play games. That the power of the Lord will descend upon your life and the real anointing that breaks the yoke will come upon your life you'll be a different man you'll be a different woman then you go out there and you put the devil on the run i said you put the devil on the run and then we'll be dealing with the discipline the discipline if there's anything that is missing today was that discipline people cannot discipline their tongue or discipline their lives or discipline their emotion or discipline their desires and it is because there is no self-discipline that church discipline comes if there is self-discipline church discipline will not be necessary in fact the chastisement of the Lord and the discipline from the Lord will not be necessary once there is self-discipline because if there is self-discipline, you are going to resist temptation. And you are going to live the life that is acceptable to the Lord. And you are going to live in such a way that the power of the Spirit of God puts you under perpetual control. And whether it's in the public or it's in the private, that control discipline of the holy spirit will be upon your life and in everything you do and everywhere you go and the things you say and the things you don't say and your interaction and your relationship will be completely and totally under the control of the spirit of god that's why you need to listen and it's not only listening you need to pray each in were leaders here when you hear the word of god for such a long time one hour for all those who are preaching thank you for keeping to one hour one and a half hours two hours for papa isn't that right you know because uh, I, when i was younger i used to run 35 minutes i'm through 45 minutes young man i'm through but now, as old age is coming in, and you need to pour out everything before you leave, before you go to glory. And for those who want to hear, you bring your empty vessel. Before I fill it, it takes me more than one hour. One hour, one and a half hours, I will manage. Are you all right? When you listen to the word of God, one hour, one and a half hours. And then at the time we're about to pray, that's the time you stand up and then you go to the toilet. When we finish the prayer, then you come back. You are, one of, you are not one of the people that are going to be ready for the end time revival. And when we finish the prayer, or after all that soul tearing and the soul wrenching prayer, we are prayed here, sweating and screaming to the Lord, Oh Lord, pour the anointing down. And then we go out there. And then we talk it away, like something talking and talking and talking to Delilah. And then in our little, little groups after the prayer, after hearing the word of God, instead of coming, going back to the hostel and falling upon your face and saying, Oh Lord, here am I, anoint me like you anointed Elisha. Instead of that kind of prayer, you see us pockets of people here and there talking and talking and talking. And by the time we come back the following day, all the thing we got the previous, everything is leaked away. And we don't even remember anything. All we remember is what so-and-so said, what so-and-so said, and what I told so-and-so. 
the Lord is calling us to a convocation of sobriety and seriousness and dedication to the Lord. That when you come over here, you hear the word of God and the hammer of the word of God strikes your heart and breaks the rocks in pieces. And even after that, you don't know how to talk anymore. You go straight to your hostel or you remain, you remain over here and you lie on your face before the Lord and say, No, Lord, if you don't convert me once again, I'm not talking of salvation. If you don't turn me around once again, I'm not talking of repentance for the sinners. If you don't put a fire within me again and do something more than I've got before, I'm not going to leave this place. Those are the kinds of people that the Lord is preparing today. And then you come out of this place as fire brands. But you know the people that you know they are just here like they are the general retreat. Or they are here like they are in a crusade. And they are not getting something in their heart in their life. And the control and the discipline of the Holy Ghost is not coming upon them. You are not going to get much. And the Lord is going to set you aside and push you away and put somebody there that will get the work done in these last days. In these last days, don't need errors there. The errors that cannot take his time and the errors that cannot defend sound doctrine and the errors within 40 days that Moses had gone. It may be a sugar-coated mouth man. It may be a person that can talk very well, but he doesn't have the stamina and the courage and the competence and the discipline and he cannot stand earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto, unto the saints. We're going to pack all those errors aside and let Moses the stammerer, let him come. Here is a person that can stand. And those are the kinds of people that the Lord is looking for today. The people that will stand on that discipline. Here does says the word of God and they stand by that word of God. We don't need the people like Absalom's here today. The people that you know as, as for talking they can talk. As for conversation convincing the people they can convince them as for turning their minds in a political kind of a thing they can do that but they do not have the word of god they do not have the spirit of god they do not have the discipline of a child of god or of a leader that is crucified all those ones are packed aside. We don't need people like demons. They can, you know, as long as everything is going on well, they follow after Paul, after Paul the apostle. But then when the things of the world are glittering and inviting them, there is no discipline to be able to stand. We don't need them today. We need the people that will be like Paul the apostle, that I put my body under. So that after I preach to all the people, I will not be a cast away. Those are the people we need today. And all the other people, I'm telling you, all the other people with God and I, by the grace of God, with I in Christ, all the other people, we're going to look at them. And if they are not going to stand, and if they're not going to have the discipline of a crucified leader, the Lord will use me. And the Lord will also use other people, get them out of the way, and make room for the people that are ready today. That's the reason as you come to this Congress, you make up your mind. All these leadership qualities that the Lord is giving unto us, we're going to get them. I said we're going to get them. And if you have been, if you have been at the conference and you are just there, you are just there. And it's like, you know, like you, are, you came to other conferences, no change, no transformation, no touch of the Lord at all. If you don't get serious with the Lord and get something done, God will push you aside. We will push you aside. The church will push you aside. The leadership will push you aside. You might be an Absalom. And it might be that you have gathered the minds of the people together and the people are after you and it's you they want to put on the throne but we'll put you aside don't worry about all those other people and the power of god in this church and the authority of the word of god all those supporters of absalom will push them aside to you and we're marching on i said we're marching on because this church will stand on the foundation of the word of God. There are all the other things there. I'll be teaching them. I'll be talking about them when I get to them. The session we have now is discipline. Everybody say discipline. Say it well. Discipline of crucified leaders. In Galatians chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. That's a disciplined leader. That's Paul the Apostle. That's the effective leader. That's a competent leader. That's a consecrated leader. That's the one that is totally sold out to the law. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In chapter 5 of Galatians verse 24, chapter 5 verse 24, here we are told still about crucifixion day that are Christ's. I've crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, when it says it has crucified the flesh, I want you to do something now. You are going to do some writing. Are you ready? You will write that flesh, but you write it in another way. I'll, I'll show you how to write it. You start from the end of the word flesh. The end of the word flesh. What's that? Put a dash after you've, after you've written H. And then you write the next letter. What's that? Then write the next. What's that? Then write the next. What's that? And what's the last thing? What's that? If you don't read it the way you are written it now. H. Self. Himself. Herself. That's flesh. The sin in you that we call self. That's actually when it says flesh, it's not your body like this. It's not your flesh and bones. It's not saying you crucify your flesh. It's talking about self. It's talking about the self life. And it says, They that are Christ, appointed by Christ, anointed by Christ, sent by Christ, they have crucified self with the affections and the lost and now they live in the spirit it says then let us walk in the spirit that's the crucifixion then in chapter 6 verse 14 but god forbid that i should glory save except in the cross of our lord jesus christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I to the world. It tells us about the crucifixion. One, I am crucified. I. What's that? If you look at the word sin, S I N, the middle letter is I. If you look at the word pride, the middle letter is I. And if there is anything that, calls, that causes people to go back into sin, it is the I. I want this. I desire this. I want pleasure. I. That middle letter, the central letter, the controlling letter in sin remains in them. But when you come to the Lord, there are three things that work together. Conversion, consecration, and crucifixion. When you come to the Lord and you are converted, and that conversion has really taken place, the I in the middle of sin is dealt with. I am crucified with Christ. And then the middle letter in the word pride. You know, there are people that uh, they say they are born again. But they're still men of their own ideas, and men of their own opinions, and men of their own desires. Whatever they want to do is what they do anytime. And the I, which is the center of pride, controls them. But it says, I am crucified. Sin is dealt with, pride is dealt with. And then he goes on to the next verse we have read. And he said, they who belong to Christ, they have the flesh himself, herself, they have self crucified. And then he goes to the next reference on crucifixion in this Galatians. And he says, the world is crucified unto me. And I am crucified unto the world. Therefore, because the world is crucified unto me, all those things in the world, they do not appeal to me. And of course, my life doesn't appeal to the world. I am crucified to the world. 
The life of the crucified leader is characterized by discipline. And all aspects of his life are brought under the mastery of the Holy Spirit. In the strength of the Lord, in his inner man, he takes hold of himself and he stays in full control of himself. Uh, you find that, uh, you know, some people who are so-called leaders, uh, if they are men, once, you know, a woman comes to them, not their wives. They cannot control their speech. They cannot control their emotion. They cannot control their ideas. They'll just, even if they were counseling, and you have a lot of people still waiting for counseling, you know, they are taking in with that woman just talking, 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 and they forget themselves. But you see, the man who is crucified, he doesn't do that. And there are some people, is food. And once they see that kind of food, it may be they're going to preach. But they'll fill up so much, they become inconvenient. And they say they're born again. Gluttony is a problem. Other people, it's drinking. Now we know that believers don't drink alcohol. But even when they drink, all these uh, things that have a lot of sugar in, and they're already having diabetes at 36, 37 years of age. And they drink these, uh, all these uh, minerals. They drink and drink and drink and drink without control. Or it is, uh, if it is, you know, all these other things that is going to give them disease, they just eat and eat without control. And they profess being born again. But you know, when you are born again, the totality of your life, your interaction, everything comes under the control of the Spirit of God. And you come in the strength of the Lord. And in your inner man, you are not controlled from outside. You are controlled from inside. And I'm telling you that if you're a preacher, there are a lot of outside forces that will try to control you. They try to control the doctrine you preach. They'll try to control the details of the things you mention in preaching if you allow them. But if you're a disciplined, crucified leader, you are not controlled from outside. From what the people say, from what the people do, from their opinions about you, from their gossips about you. The disciplined, crucified leader is, constro is controlled from the inside. Discipline and self-control are essential characteristics of a leader. Without those characteristics, you diminish in effectiveness. And you lose the unction, the anointing, the power of the Lord upon your life. But we see it with that discipline and crucifixion. Then you keep the anointing. Then you keep the effectiveness in ministry. And people will view you as one that has, will view you as one that have the as one that has the determination and strength to be in charge. But if you don't have the discipline of it and the crucifixion, they will be in charge. It'll just be the figurehead. They'll challenge every decision you make. They'll challenge every move you make. They'll challenge every direction you follow. They'll challenge every doctrine you preach if you're not in charge. And the people from outside there, they'll want to control, want to control the church, want to control the doctrine of the church, the lifestyle of the church, even the programs of the church. And everything will, will, will depend upon them. You'll be sheepishly following them because you are not a leader, under control, under discipline. But when the hand of the Lord grabs you, and the hand of the Lord grips you, and the hand of the Lord controls you, and the word of the Lord with the Spirit of God takes full charge of your life, then you know the fire may burn and the wind may blow and the rain may fall but you're following the straight course that the lord has appointed and called you to that's what the lord wants to do and he will do it i said he will do it i'm talking to you on the discipline of crucified leaders point number one the description of crucified life the crucified life number two the discipline of the crucified leader. Then number three, daily duties of crucified leaders. Number one, the description of the crucified lie. The description of the crucified lie. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 6 
Here we read in the word of God. Knowing this. That our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. When you are born again, we call that conversion. And then you hand over your life completely unto the Lord. And when you hand over your life to the Lord, we call that consecration. And then the Lord does something in your life. You are crucified. Crucifixion. Conversion. Consecration. Crucifixion. And it says, it is the old man that is crucified. That is, it is a self-life that is crucified. Because you see, any human being, you grew up with that self-life. My desires, self-life. My wants, self-life. My likes, what I like, self-life. My opinion, self-life. And if we're in a meeting together, and all the people are bringing out spirit-led and spirit-given uh, spirit suggestions. And then you bring your own. And if we say, uh, brother, it looks like we're going to follow another path at this time. This is not the thing to do. The self-life will come up if you are not crucified. What do you mean? I've been in this place for a long time. And I said, this is the way it must be done. That's the self and that's the I in the middle of the word pride. It may be that we want to, you know, start something new in the church. And we say now we're going to have the language church strengthened. And the language overseers are going to be in charge of the language area. And the English is, overseer will be in charge of the English area. If you are not crucified, self will come up immediately. You begin to think of your position. You begin to think of what you are going to lose if we do this. You are not thinking of the gain to the kingdom of God. You are not thinking of the, about the evangelization. You are not thinking about the majority of the people in the land that speak the language. All you are thinking about is, how does that affect my position? How does that affect all the respect the people have been giving me? I've been controlling every one of them all till, up till this time. And now they're dividing into two. The language uh, people may even be more than the English people in this, our land, in this, our region. And then what's going to happen? What happens to the young people? Where do they go? What happens to the old people? Where do they go? Selfish consideration will come in. But when you come to the Lord, and the Lord takes over your life, and then you are crucified. It then means that Christ will be the all in all. And what matters to you will be, what does the Lord say? What does the leader say? It is self that puts the leader down. It is pride that puts the leader down. What God raises up, self will pull down. And you will enjoy the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, verse 7 as well, that you will obey them that I have rule over you. When there is no self, that will be your desire. But when self is there, who is pastor? Who is leader? Who are those people? I don't know them. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And it is an evidence that self had not been crucified. But it says, when you are crucified, sin is dealt with. Self is dealt with. Society, the opinion of society upon your life is dealt with. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the very body of sin, the nucleus of sin, the origin of sin, and the producer of sin, and the thing that generates the generator of sin in your life might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. It tells us in verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves 
to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. When you come to the Lord, you are converted, you are born again, you are a child of God, and self is crucified from your life and sin also is crucified the old man the adamic nature is dealt with getting ready for that old nature to be taken out of the way so that it will even be destroyed the body of sin the nucleus of sin and the propensity to sin when that is dealt with it says now you're obeying from the heart your obedience is no more superficial your obedience is no more conditional your obedience is no more seasonal. You know, there are some people, they have seasonal obedience. Maybe something good happen and they are happy for this moment, then they obey. Occasional obedience. You know, it, it just happens that uh, the clock is correct, the dead clock is correct two times a day. And the clock had been dead to 5.30. And when it's 5.30 in the morning, the clock appears correct. And when it's 5.30 in the evening, the clock appears correct. And there are some people like that, accidentally they are correct and they are obedient because it's a dead clock. And you come to them at a particular season, occasionally, they appear correct. Not that kind of obedience. But the obedience that is coming right from the heart. Every time, always being obedient to the word of the Lord. And that's what it says in that verse 17. That from the heart, that form of doctrine which had been delivered unto you, you're obedient unto it. Being then in verse 18 made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak out of the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness in the past and to iniquity in the past unto iniquity even now that you have crossed the line even now that you are born again now yield your members servants to righteousness and unto holiness and that's, that's the kind of obedience the Lord actually requires and if we're going to be leaders competent leaders, effective leaders that's the kind of obedience that is going to be required from you and if you're going to make it in rapture as well obedience unconditional Obedience not just for a season. Obedience not occasional. Obedience that is coming from your sincerity. Coming from your heart. Living that life of obedience all the time. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. Ye are dead. The real you on the inside. The I within. The center of sin. I. The center of pride. I. That's the real you. It's dead. It's crushed. It's cancelled. It's removed. And it's no more having the controlling power and influence upon your life. For ye are dead, and your life is seed with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What's the consequence? What are you to do as a result of that? Verse 5. Mortify therefore. If you look at the Bible in your own language, you understand that word mortify, it means kill. It means destroy. Destroy, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. What are those members? Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. That is a kind of interest in something. That is exaggerated. Too much interest in nothing. Inordinate affection. A kind of interest and love and affection for a person. And even when that person is making you less effective in ministry, 
you still center your affection and your love and your interest on him on her that's an inordinate affection or when it's a, maybe a particular drink that you love so much and already the thing is giving you maybe is giving you diabetes or whatever too much sugar in your system and you still love that thing all the same inordinate affection or maybe there's a particular thing you have been interested in and you're doing and then other people around you who see the calling of God upon you and they are realizing this thing you're doing will destroy your ministry it will destroy your effectiveness and they try to tell you directly and indirectly and yet you have so much interest and love and affection for that thing you keep on doing it to your own destruction inordinate affection and the Lord is saying that all those things you get rid of them mortify them and then evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them that's in the past but now ye also put up all these anger wrath malice blasphemy Feel the communication out of your mouth. Lie not. You know there are people that have read the Bible for more than 15 years, for more than 20 years. And they still tell lies. And they tell their lies in their action. And they tell their lies even with words. And if you confront them, if you are bold enough to confront them, Brother, hi about this. I don't know. And he knows. Why did this happen? And then they'll immediately give you a lie that will make you to say, there's nothing to it. This is this, is this and it's all a lie. And they've re been reading Bible for 20 years, for more than 20 years. And the word of God tells us that those who love and make lies, they manufacture lies, they won't get to heaven. They are abominable and all liars shall have their patch in the lake which born with fire and brimstone. And the Lord is saying, When you enter into the crucified life, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put up the old man with his deeds. And now you are put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The crucified life then is a victorious life. The crucified life is a controlled life. The crucified life issues out, comes out in a life that is well disciplined under the discipline of the Holy Ghost under the discipline of the scripture under the discipline of leadership in the church in first corinthians chapter 9 first corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 but i keep my body under nobody will do it for you you have to do it yourself when the grace of god for conversion has come in and the grace of God for crucifixion is present there. And the grace of God for consecration is manifest. That's what you'll do. I keep my body under. And bring it into subjection. I do it myself, Paul the apostle said. And you have to do it yourself. It's then we're told that he said the reason why he's doing that is so that less by any means when i preach to others i myself should be a castaway uh, that's the reason you want to put your tongue under control your mind under control your thoughts under control your temper under your control and when you are really crucified the tongue, the temper, the thoughts, the time, 
everything will be under the control of the spirit and the scripture. The crucified leader does not live or lead by popular opinion. In fact, the crucified leader has a strong character and he can stand alone. He is committed to holiness and holiness never counts his companions. Maybe I need to explain that to you. Holiness never counts its companions. When you begin to count your companions, when you begin to say, how many people are agreeing with me? How many people are smiling at me? How many people appreciate me? How many people love me? How many people will support me? How many people run and, uh, will run around me? You're going to lose the fervency for holiness. Because the majority of people in this world, around you, outside the kingdom of God, they don't love holiness. And if you are counting, how many people like me and support me and appreciate me, they, there will be few, very, very few. They will be in the minority. And if you are a person looking for the appreciation of the crowd, you're not going to be holy. But the disciplined man, the crucified man, is so committed to holiness that he does not count his companions. Because holiness will not count its companions. And one of the characteristics of the crucified man is the restrained tongue. Too much talking, like that or something. Too much indiscriminate talking, or what we call in district talking has made many to lose their leadership and they've lost the confidence that they ought to have they lose we lose confidential information and the loss of effectiveness in ministry and sometimes it you know sometimes it surprises me that now you even have to watch a very i have to watch very carefully that you know i meet with just a few people maybe about five about about nine and these are people I thought here's what we need to plan and then I say come over here I'm praying about something and what I'm praying about is you know to do this and to do this and to do that I, I don't want to tell the church yet I want to pray through about it I want to think through about it and I'm giving it to you because you are very close to me and you're in the leadership so uh, go and think over this and pray over this and if the lord reveals anything to you i'm going to pray to you if the lord reveals something to me i'm going to you know do what the lord says i should do at the right time i'll bring it to the church and then i'm discussing with somebody outside the circle of the people i spoke to different from those five different from those nine people and then as, as I'm talking to them, uh, the fellow wants to tell me that he also has, uh, you know, information uh, and indirectly and in a methodical way, he, he tells me. And then I, you know, he, and the fellow may not know that I, I got him. And then I will want to question him. And then I will say, do you, what do you mean? Do you mean this? Do you mean this? And then he will explain. And then I will know among those nine people I discussed with that I thought were disciplined, crucified leaders, the information had gone out. And we have not even prayed through yet about it to know what we're going to tell the church. And then it's already, you know, going from this to this and to this. And, uh, you know, the ushers already have an information and the security already have, they have something about it and you know choir they already have it they already know something and eventually you know they, they are surprised if i don't do that that thing anymore because now we don't have time to pray through about it so i just i just leave it off my mind i say at the right time it will come and then they're expecting you know, because they're telling one another uh, you know pastor when he comes to church son on sunday this is what he's going to say this is what he's going to do we have the information already and then they're disappointed because i come and i lead all the singing and do all i want to do and preach and then i don't mention that thing they say what's happening what's up? they go back to their informant I, I, pastor did not mention that thing on sunday he will mention it then the following sunday there's nothing and then following week following month and two three months is forgotten and then we'll put it there say when the people have lost interest they're not looking at that again then i'll have time to pray and then we'll bring it up again but if you're crucified and if you're disciplined you will know that information that is confidential doesn't just go out like that you say in the church yes because peter james and john went with jesus christ to the mount of transfiguration 
And there were nine other disciples waiting back at home. And then they saw the glory of the Lord. And while they were coming back, Jesus told them, the three disciples, and he said, this one, don't open your mouth, don't tell anyone until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And Peter, James, and John did not tell Andrew, and they did not tell Matthew, and they did not tell the other apostles, there was nothing sinful in what they saw. It was just that Jesus said, this is not to be given out until the resurrection of the Son of Man. And why can't we do that today? That we're still planning something. The glory that shall be revealed. The program that shall be held. And the things that shall be done. And maybe if uh, you are one of those uh, people, that you, you have the privilege of being near to the general superintendent. And because he doesn't want you, you know, just walk it alone. But please understand, in leadership, there are times that the leader will have to walk alone. And will have to think through alone. Will have to stand alone. There are times that the leader will, you know, keep it all to himself. And then at the right time, he brings it out. That's okay for a leader. But then there are times you may call one or two. I'm thinking about this. I'm planning this. Pray along with me. And then if he tells you, don't tell your wife. This is not women's business. Don't tell your friends. This is not for fellowship. This is between me and you. The leader is saying, this is what he wants. And then as a crucified leader, and as a disciplined leader, you are able to say what you ought to say, and you are not saying what you ought not to say. And you know, sometimes it even surprises me that uh, some of these uh, people that have left the church and they are still, uh, they are nice to me because they still say that I'm their father. I thank God for the grace he has given me. And even though I know sometimes I'm very firm, but these people, they still have some respect for me and uh, they have left. And sometimes some of them will just appear, show up in my office on Sunday while counseling. Oh, how are you? Oh, I'm all right. What did you come to do today? I've not heard from you for a long time. Even though I've left, I'm still praying for you and your, my family. And, and we love you. You're still our father in the Lord. Even though we have left this and I say thank you very much. And then, but before they go, they want to show me that they are still, even though they are away, they are still inside. And then they are telling me something that, you know, even the majority of people in the church, they don't know. And these people coming from outside, then they will smile. And when they smile like that, I get ready because now I understand. I, I know. I know what they are going to. I know something is coming on. Then they will smile. They will say, sir, please uh, don't say that, you know, because I've left. And then they will say, hi about this, hi about this, hi about this. Then I will look at them with a neutral face and I will say, hi about it. Then they will say, hey, it's about uh, brother so and so, please, uh, pastor. Hi about this and something. Then I will say what those Pharisees said to uh, what the mother and the father of the man whose eyes were opened. Uh, what they said to the Pharisees is an adult, a man. Let him speak for himself. And once I give them that quotation, they shut up. They understand. But how is it that here we tell something to some inner circle people and then even those who have left the church we're hearing from them because our tongues are not under control but when you become crucified and disciplined your tongue will be under control your temper will be under control your thoughts will be under control your time will be under control. We're told in Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 32. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth a spirit than he that taketh a city. Then we're told in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. He that keepeth his tongue keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his leaves shall have destruction. I come to point number two. 
the discipline of the crucified leader. The discipline of the crucified leader. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. As thou found honey, eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Even when you find something very nice, very interesting to you, it says, just eat so much. Let your appetite be under control. In Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs chapter 31, verses 3, 4, and 5. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for thee, for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And that's why you must be in control, so that your mind will be functioning in a balanced way all the time, so that you will not be distracted by what occupies your mind, by what intoxicates you. You know, many things can intoxicate people. Even joy can intoxicate us. Something has happened. You become so joyful. And you're as joyful as a drunkard. And then you forget yourself and give yourself away. It should never happen to the leader. The leader should be such, should be under control, under discipline, in such a way that even if something joyful, happy has happened, you're still under control, you're not intoxicated. Or it may be that it's money that has come in, in your place of work. And sometimes, suddenly, that that large amount of money comes, it can intoxicate you. And you, you'll begin to you tell this and tell this and tell this and tell this. And before you know what, uh, you know, there are people that are, even people didn't expect, they'll say, uh, brother, can you lend me, uh, and then they'll not mention, they'll not mention ordinary amount. Can you lend me 500,000? And you ask them, have you handled 5,000 before? No. How are you going to handle 500,000 if I lent you? Ah, but they say you have the money. Who told you I have the money? Ah, we know we have information. And the people that cannot control their tongue, they have given information out. Because you too, having the money suddenly, you are intoxicated. And the thing you are telling everybody everywhere, praise the Lord with me, you think you are telling testimony, you are just intoxicated. But it is not for kings to drink wine. When some of those good, some of those good things have happened, keep it yourself. When should you talk? How should you talk? Who should you talk to about it? That's the discipline of the leader. And something has happened in the church and the great wonderful thing. And the Lord has provided for the church such a wonderful thing, you know. Uh, we wanted to uh, build uh, our sanctuary, our temple or whatever. And somebody just wrote everything out. And he came to us and he asked us and he said, how much uh, will the thing cost? And then you say, maybe you said, uh, they said it will cost us uh, 20 million. Okay, no, you don't need to make an announcement looking for money anymore. Here is the 20 million naira check. Here have it. And then, uh, you know, you, you're intoxicated. And you're mad with joy. You are a drunkard now. And you have drunk, you have drunk the wine of money. And then you come on Sunday. And there's so many people there on Sunday. So many people there on Sunday. There are good people there. There are bad people there. Because when you throw the net into the sea, it will gather both the bad fish and the, and the good fish. And it's on the day of judgment, the Lord will say, gather the bad ones, throw them back, and then gather the good ones, and then throw them into the kingdom. There are some bad people there too. And then you'll say, praise the Lord, I have something to tell you today. You know, all this announcement we'll be making about, you know, we need money. And, and I told you, church, I told you that God is a faithful God. In fact, my faith now has reached has reached beyond the ceiling. My faith now has reached the sky. And I'm telling you, if I begin to clap before I tell you the information I'm going to give, the man is drunk. The man is drunk. And then he tells them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you, uh, pay attention. I, I don't want you to idolize anybody, but I'm just telling you, brother so and so, God has used him. He's living in such and such a place. You are sending armed robbers to his house. 
is leaving his number so so and so on the street and do you know God has blessed him so much that the 20 million naira we're looking for that brother so and so brother are you in church today I know you don't like to be publicized but I know you are humble but please stand up please stand up obey your pastor and then the fellow stands up and all the robbers there they look at the face of the man that man has money and after the service, they drive and they follow him home. They know his house. Now they have identified the place. You have sold the man into the hands of those who will kill him. Because you are intoxicated. When something like that has happened in the church, it's for the glory of God. The Lord has provided glory be to his name. And there's no publicity of that man so you don't ruin the man. You'll be under control. The discipline of the crucified leader. And apart from selling him into the hands of the people that may want to rob him, also you are making him to be proud. He'll be uncontrollable. And if he does anything or if his children do anything scandalous and you want to discipline him, how can you discipline him? You told the old church already that he is a pillar behind the church. He's the untouchable person. He's the financier of the church. How will you do that now? But when you are disciplined, you thank God for what God has done. But you don't exalt him. And you allow him to stay in his place. You don't allow pride that you ruin him to come to him. Discipline is the ability to restrain ourselves. To be resolute. Ever ready to, di to discipline yourself and even your strong desires. And you endure joy. Maybe you've never had that before. You endure joy. You endure happiness. Some people cannot endure joy. They can endure pain. They can endure want. They can endure lack. They can endure some difficulty. But they cannot endure joy. They cannot endure appreciation. When everybody is coming around them, praise the Lord, thank God, you are a great man, you are a great woman, this has happened, we are hearing stories about you, ah, even though we are not at the headquarters, we are hearing about you, keep on the good work, they cannot endure that appreciation, and then it will get into their head, it will get into their mind, they will begin to swell up, but you see, if you are a disciplined man, and if you are a crucified man, if it is pain, you endure. If it is joy, you endure. You are still under control. The, the leader who is disciplined may have strong desires. But those strong desires may try to distract him from the God-giving goal. But he keeps those desires under control. And a first step towards effective leadership is a God-given vision. A clear picture of what God has called him to do and what God has called him to be. And he must not be diverted from this vision by the opinions of men or by the subtle pressures of the people. If there is anything that crushes the leader that is not disciplined, it is the subtle, subtle, clever pressures of the people. And it doesn't matter where you are a leader. The people, here is where you are going. Here is your destination. Here is the God giving goal where you ought to reach but the people they are not in the they are not in the committee with god and they are not in conference with god they don't understand where we're going and they don't understand where the goal is and the lord will not tell them and the lord has not told them and in their own mind they think you should go in this other direction and when you are going in this direction and of course will not announce to them because the disciplined leader, he does not try to explain everything to everybody. Church, please. Please understand, it's not me wanting to do this. This is the place the Lord has wanted us, has told us to go. That's why we're do we don't always explain. We don't have to explain. And then the people that feel that that's not the right direction, this is the way we should go. Then they'll have subtle pressure upon you. And that is when a leader that is not disciplined and controlled, that's when you collapse. That's when you are crushed. That's when you are destroyed. That's when you are distracted. Then you begin, you say, well, I don't want trouble. Nobody wants trouble. It's discipline that makes us to understand. If my going the direction of God creates trouble, do I have any choice? I'm going there. 
And I know where I'm going. And I'm reaching there. But a subtle pressure will crush the mind and crush the life of the people that are not under discipline. It is discipline that helps the leader to keep his eyes on the goal. Discipline, self-control actually will work best when you have made up your decisions ahead of time. And then you live according to those decisions. And if that is going to be the case, look at First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Already you, you know that this is the direction to go. And this is the thing to achieve. And the subtle pressures of the people who have decided that you must go in the opposite direction. If you're a disciplined leader, controlled leader, crucified leader, you, you overlook all those things. And then you just go your way. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. You just say, well, that's one of those things, appearance of evil, I'm going to abstain, and then you abstain. And then we're told in the word of God, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, fleshly desires, private desires, distracting desires, which war against the soul. Those desires will work against, against the place you really want to go. And um, uh, please look up here. There are some times that some needs will be in your life. I remember many, many years ago. While emphasizing, I will still do emphasize, the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And somebody here is not in the church anymore now. But, you know, he was at that time very conspicuous. And not, he, wasn't, he was never a state leader. So he said to himself, so don't think about this or that. But this person was very, very, very close. And almost every day he'll come to Flatu at the university. And God blessed him. But privately he was discussing with me. And he was saying, you know, uh, he'll come with brother so and so. This holiness and, you know, this sanctification. Uh, that's, that's my problem. I like the healing, I like the faith, I like the Holy Ghost baptism, I like every other thing. Even the marriage, as difficult as it is, one man, one wife, I also like that too. Although I'm not having, you know, it easy with my wife, but all the same, that one I accept. But this holiness, never, don't get angry. Your tempers must, be, not, must not be ruffled. Just, you know, go straight like this, be gentle, be nice. It says, if you know the condition where I am, this scene is tough and difficult. And uh, that's the challenge I face. I don't, I, I, I don't fully agree with this. And I said, well, you pray and see the word of God. You're an intelligent man, educated man. And you happen to be a person that, you know, if you see something, you can analyze, go and analyze this and look at the word of God. And he still came back and he said, well, I, I'm sorry, this holiness and education, it's still a problem to me. And then one day, he just came and he bought this a great big car. And at that time, I was lecturing at the University of Lagos. And for me to go from the education uh, department over here, College of Education at that time, and go to the main campus and walk. I'll walk there, long distance, and walk back, lecturer. And this uh, brother, he just brought the car, and then he said, take this. I said, what's that? He said, a key. I, I said, key to what? He said, a key to, you know, the car is outside. I parked it outside. I looked at him at the face. I said, my brother, I'm sorry. I can't take it. He said, what? What did you see? I said, nothing. I said, on one point, we disagree. Sanctification. And I will not allow you to spend your money on me and support me and be preaching what you don't agree with. Take your car away. He was so disappointed, he left deeper life. But that's all right. Because if he had stayed, an influential man, a great man, a rich man, a prospered man, if he had stayed, I don't know whether sanctification will still remain today. You must be so disciplined that even though you have a need, 
And you have a need to have this and to have that. But you know what the Lord has called you for? In this country and in this life, the Lord has called me that I will preach the sanctification and the holiness. And anybody, no matter how useful you are, no matter how profitable you are, and no matter if you have the minds of all the people in the church, and you can drive them, and you can motivate them, and you have all the people behind you. If you go against, either in a subtle way, or in a direct way, against the word of holiness and sanctification, we part. Because that's my very vision, that's my very life, that's my very calling. All the other doctrines are standing because of sanctification, because of holiness. And when you touch it, you touch the whole ministry. Kill me then. What am I living for? If you touch the holiness, and you take the holiness away, and then you influence people not to accept the holiness, what am I living for? And then you say you are a friend. And then you say you are a worker. And then you say you are a financier. And then you say, Pastor, I'm giving you this. I'm giving, keep it to yourself. Who wants your car? Who wants your money? Who wants everything you've got? When you destroy my very heart, the heart of the Christian faith is holiness and sanctification. When you pinch the heart of the man, when you put your dagger on the heart of the man, when you kill that man, you take his heart away. After you destroy his heart, then you give him a car. How is he going to drive the car with no heart? You've taken his life away. You've destroyed him. And now you give him a car. What am I going to use that for? All your talent and all the gifts you have. All your smiling and all the ability. All the skill you have. All the running around. What's he going to be useful for when there's no salvation? There's no holiness. And then we confuse the people. And they're not ready to get to heaven. Give me holiness and take the rest of the things away. Do I need salary? Do I need money? Do I need car? Do I need house? Do I need children? Ask my wife. If it were not because, you know, she prayed and she said, we must have children. Do I need children? Do I need money? Do I need anything? Is it only holiness? Is it, it only holiness I need? And if you take the holiness away in a subtle way, and then you are eroding into it, and you are destroying it, and then we don't have any mouth again to talk about holiness, what are you doing? You pack your load and go. I don't need you with any of the gifts you have. Give me holiness and take the rest away. Holiness. That the very center, the disciplined leader doesn't worry. Doesn't worry what you take away from him. Once the holiness is still there, number three is the daily duty of the crucified leader. The daily duty of the crucified leader. In, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Joshua chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 8. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 it says this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That's your duty every day. To meditate on the word of God. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Let's rise up and pray.